Well, it's the same sensation you get watching ITV. Anyway, um, first, my thanks, um, or our thanks, to uh, Denise and uh, Kate for a very special um, presentation of our new um, website resource. I just make the observation that during the course of showing that, both Georgina, an expert in these things, and Alison equally, have complimented us um, on uh, what has been uh, a, a remarkably well-developed website. So well done then. Now, apparently questions are pouring in, so I'm going to um, ask Tina now to lead the Q&A session. So over to you, Tina. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don, um, and welcome back. And a really warm welcome to Alison and Georgina, Kate and Denise. Those presentations were amazing. Thank you very much. As always, with the Retina UK community, we have stacks and stacks of questions. So we're going to do our best uh, just to make sure that we get through as many as we can meaningfully. But if you have asked a question, and you don't feel that you've got the information you need, uh, the team and I are available as we always are next week. So please do get back in touch. So without further ado, I'm going to dive in, ladies. So firstly, Georgina, um, a question for you from Patricia. Uh, when will the whole genome sequencing be common practice for patients with inherited diseases? Uh, good morning. That's lovely to be here. Can you hear me OK? Absolutely. Super, thank you. Um, so uh, that's a very good question, and I think it isn't one that I fully know the answer to at the moment. So um, uh, the new uh, National Test Directory just launched um, earlier in February, and currently most of the um, uh, inherited eye conditions are are being offered via a panel approach that you'll be familiar with, where the um, testing looks for the known genes uh, causing that particular condition. And so for retinal dystrophy at the moment, the panel approach is a very good approach, and that's the approach that's being used on the um, test directory. Whole genome sequencing is being offered for some sorts of genetic conditions where the panel approach isn't so successful, and so whole genome is beginning to be um, rolled out in some um, particular groups of conditions, perhaps some of the more syndromic intellectual disability conditions. Um, but as far as I know at the moment, that's not uh, planned for retinal dystrophies, but uh, we, will, we will wait and see when that becomes available. Thank you, Georgina. So I'm going to put two similar questions together, and I think probably Alison and Kate will have some comments on this. The first part of the question is, why do genetic test results take so long to come back? Um, and also, I've had a blood test for genetic testing a while ago, but I think it might have just been for a research project. So how do I get the results? Okay, well, I think maybe Georgina can help with this as well, I'm sure. So in terms of why it takes so long, um, an actual fact, I mean, for me, it seems like a reasonably short amount of time to get a result from a diagnostic test. Don't forget, we have to be absolutely sure, Georgina, don't we, about the, the, the result that we feed back to individuals. Uh, and that can take time with, with, with a panel of experts looking at the data. So it's not just a matter of the sequencing, the computing, um, it's the interpretation and being absolutely sure we give the right information back. Georgina, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Thank you, Alison. So, yes, I, co I completely agree. So when we when we sequence the, the retinal dystrophy panel, for example, with 176 genes on it, we find uh, many variants within those genes and the work of the um, bioinformatics to filter through those variants and then to um, look back at phenotype and all of the clinical evidence around those variants to, to know whether that variant could be uh, the cause of the condition. It, it, it's a lot of work for the individual clinical scientists. And of course, we have um, a, a big demand. The scientists are working on lots and lots of samples. So within the NHS, that's, that's just how long it takes to work through um, that, that kind of extensive data for all the patients coming through. Thank you. Thank you. Kate, did you, did you want to add anything, Kate, to that? Um, no, I think that's a really comprehensive uh, answer to the first part of the question. What was the second part? Could you just remind me again, Tina, what the second part of the question was? That was about a sample for research, yes. right? Yes. yes, so the second part of the question was about giving blood some time ago, but thinking it might have been for a research project. So is there a way to access the results? Or if that there's a result, I guess. Yeah, that, that's, an, that's an important question as well. Um, I guess the, quest, the, 
to put back to you is, is who did you give your sample to? Whoever you gave your sample to, to connect with them in the first instance to find out what's happened to your sample or if there is any data coming from it. But I hope you can appreciate from the talks today, you know, to get into the panels that Kate and Georgina have been talking about, to have the diagnostic tests. We need to do the research to find the genes and variants that can then go into this test and we can be confident of a diagnosis. And without your samples for research, we could never have discovered, for example, the LP17 story that we talked about today. So it's, it's, we really are incredibly grateful for all of you for joining into the research um, that, that we do across the country. It, it's invaluable. Um, you may not get an answer. Um, for, you could see from the RP17 story that some, some individuals there have been waiting 35 to 40 years. I hope it won't be that long now. Now we have a lot more understanding, of course, but, but do be patient with the research. We need the research to feed into the diagnostics. But go back to the individual that you sent your sample to originally or the clinician who took the sample and, and ask them, please. Thank you, Alison. So um, so is that this ties into a question that came from David, um, uh, probably most notable for the Retina UK team, but I'm sure that Alison and Georgina might have some thoughts. There seems to be a lack of knowledge about um, available resources at a GP level. Do we think we could raise awareness in this section for healthcare professionals? And I think it ties into where you might be able to go back and get information potentially. Yeah, so um, we do recognise that this is quite a significant problem for our community. Um, we also recognise it's quite difficult for us as Retina UK to access GPs and certainly access every GP in the country. So uh, at the moment, our thought is that the easiest way to access GPs is actually via our community. And that's why we have uh, added a page to the Unlock Genetics website, which is specifically for non-specialist professionals, I suppose, um, something that you can print off and take to an appointment that perhaps just helps them in a nutshell understand why uh, testing and referral for testing and counselling is important for you and your family. Um, Georgina, I don't know if you've got anything to, to add to that. Um, I, I think, I think uh, the work you've done on that website looks fantastic and I hope that would be um, a really good resource for everybody to, to use. I, I guess I would just um, say that this this is the case across the whole of, of rare disease at the moment that um, uh, there's a huge program of education going on um, from NHS England and Genomics England to out to all sorts of healthcare professionals and especially GPs around the uh, importance and impact of genomics across healthcare and so there is a big um, uh, push for education and resources for GPs about genetics and genomics. So um, you're alongside uh, a lot of uh, patients who um, uh, want to get good information to their GP and, and there's a lot of work going on to help with that. That's absolutely fabulous news. That's that, that's music, I, I suspect, to, to our audience and certainly me, that, that GPs, are, there's definitely a push towards that education at that level. That's fantastic. Um, Alison, um, a question from Liz. How do we get our genetic data shared to the UK Inherited Retinal Dystrophies Consortium? I joined the 100,000 Genome Project in 2014 um, and still haven't heard anything. I wondered if co collaboration might offer some answers. Yes, I mean, thank you for the question and it's an important one. I realise many of you will have uh, donated samples to the Genomics England 100,000 Genomes Project um, and that really is it, I want to reassure everyone that that data is being looked at. So although we formed the UK Inherited Retinal Disease D Dystrophy Consortium, and we're looking specifically at certain individuals within that consortium, uh, perhaps what didn't come across in my talk particularly well is we are constantly looking in the 100,000 genomes data. So if your sample's in there, we're looking at it. <laughs> um, so I want to reassure you about that. Um, however, we are focused on, on certain aspects of, of that and, and really it's down to just a few individuals across the UK who are really looking at that data in, in detail which is why it's taking so long and of course we're, we're learning new things all the time and hopefully the RP17 story will give you an idea of, of how much we've learned recently and how much we've still got to learn so it's not that easy to find um, difficult to find variants in, in the genome sequence that's in the 100,000 genomes data, which is why we formed our consortium, 
because essentially it's the domain knowledge and the experts. So our clinicians, our scientists, our bioinformaticians sit around a table thinking, we need to look at this region, we need to look at this locus, we need to look at this gene or this chromosome. Let's go into the 100,000 genomes data. What do we see in, in the patient cohort in that data? Can we make sense of it? Do we think this is the cause of the condition? So it's an iterative process that we are looking at that data. In terms of um, getting immediate feedback from the 100,000 genomes data, um, that's controlled by Genomics England. So there are a group of experts and we're, we're all part of that. So everyone in the UK IRDC is part of the 100,000 genomes, what we call GSIP, which is essentially a, a specialist group with that domain knowledge to help interpret the data. So it's all intertwined, even though it seems rather separate. And I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, I, I, was, I just had to smile slightly because I, I love I love a good acronym and that that's an absolute cracker. But I think that offers some reassurance that at least that data has been looked at meaningfully. So thank you very much. So um, a question for Denise. With the clinic search function, do mm -hmm. I have to go to my nearest clinic or if I have a preference, can I ask to be referred to the clinic of my choice? Yeah, um, it's things that, as I think Georgina mentioned um, in her talk, that things have changed in terms of funding uh, recently. And because of the centralised funding, um, you are actually able far more easily to choose, choose the location that you go to. The search function um, actually has uh, an ability to search by distance from your postcode, and it'll bring up your nearest clinic, but other clinics are available. I know that um, certainly in the Northwest, there's a whole lot of work that's been done as well with um, local ophthalmologists. So that the, your local ophthalmologist in many cases will actually be able to carry out a genetic test without you having to go any further afield. And of course, they've got the backup of all of the experts at the specialist center should you want to, uh, should they need to access that because of more complex um, queries that they have. But yes, you, you are able to do that now. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Denise. Um, Georgina, I've got a question from Martin. If X-linked RP runs in a family and a daughter is a carrier, is there anything she can do regarding IVF or anything similar when planning a pregnancy as a way of preventing X-linked RP being passed to the next generation? Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, so, uh, uh, you're asking about IVF and the um, reproductive uh, choices using IVF is a is a, um, uh, a thing called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where um, embryos are collected through um, an IVF, um, a normal sort of IVF process, and then the embryos can be screened for a genetic mutation, and um, couples can choose an embryo that doesn't carry the genetic mutation. And so um, PGD, um, another acronym, I'm sorry, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis um, services uh, are available on the NHS. They are licensed by the um, Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And so for genetic testing, um, a gene has to be licensed by the HFEA. Um, and uh, a particular, uh, the, one of the things that we've been talking about a bit is understanding variants and PGD is only available if there's a definite pathogenic. So that's the mutation um, uh, uh, variant in the family. So it's not possible to do PGD if it's a variant of uncertain significance. So if the genetics uh, test has been very confident in identifying the X-linked RP mutation um, in a family, then you can request to be referred to PGD. It's worth having a good conversation with a genetic counsellor about PGD and PGD options um, as, a, as a way to achieve a pregnancy through IVF. It's, it's, uh, it's not an easy way to achieve pregnancies um, and uh, there are funding issues and um, there's only a certain number of cycles that are funded by the NHS. So it's important to have a really good conversation with a genetic counsellor about those options. And then if you're interested to learn more, you can be referred through to one of the specialist PGD services. That Thank you, Georgina. Just, that's, that really does. And just following on from that, we had a question about having a diagnosis many years ago, but wasn't there, this individual wasn't offered a genetic test or an appointment with a counsellor. Um, could you give some indication about how they might go about doing that? 
Um, definitely, we, we'd really encourage, I know there's a lot of people who have had a diagnosis many years ago when genetic testing um, either wasn't available or was only available in certain places. And so please do feel able to come back and request um, referral to a genetic service to explore genetic testing. We're keen to, to meet um, uh, everybody who, who hasn't yet had a genetic diagnosis. So uh, you would be um, uh, able to go to your GP to request a referral or to your ophthalmologist if you are still under regular ophthalmology care and um, do use some of the good resources on that website to uh, take along some more information for your, your GP or your ophthalmologist to request a referral through. Thank you and just to follow on again a third time, <laughs> um, if, if someone's got um, a referral from their GP for a genetic test, can they include their family members in that referral or is it a separate activity? Um, so, uh, we uh, most genetic services uh, are happy to meet families. I, at, at the moment, in the coronavirus pandemic, we're quite limited how many people we can see in clinic. Um, but uh, uh, we, um, uh, so our, our, our service specification at the moment is um, uh, specifies that we're supposed to have GP referrals for each individual that we see in our clinic and so ideally it's helpful for different family members if you're um, uh, living around in different areas to get individual referrals through to your genetics units but if you can make sure your GP um, is aware and mentions family members one of our big challenges is if we start genetic testing in one family member and then a different family member is referred to another genetic service and the testing starts again that's not great we would rather not um, use those resources twice and so if family members can be um, communicating and sharing with their GP that their cousin's been referred to Liverpool and um, that we can access that information and share genetic testing across families that's much more um, efficient so I so I've on a little bit around the houses there if it's your own immediate family then we'll meet an immediate family in clinic and if you did bring along someone else in your family to clinic if it wasn't coronavirus that would be fine and we would manage that but um, uh, ideally uh, different family members um, being seen individually um, should have a GP referral I, I think that's changing with the service specification and self-referrals might be coming in to our genetic services but at the moment GP referrals are what we we prefer. Thank you. That's really, really useful information. Um, Alison, um, how does your work link with other genomic projects around the world? And will there be one international database? Ooh. <laughs> the dream. <laughs> the dream, yes. <laughs> so, um, yes. Uh, so as well as forming our own UK um, consortium, there is a consortium across Europe called the European Retinal dystrophy consortium um, and that brings in many of the countries across Europe but also there are representatives from the USA and Canada in that grouping and they share data it's slightly different to the way we share data within the UK because within the UK we actually share all our data so I could look at a genome from Manchester um, for example whereas in in the European consortium what we do is we talk about what we found and what might be interesting and then we go away to our our computers and our, on our data and have a look and see if we we agree or we disagree um so there is a network there um and there is a database dedicated to European consortium but it's really to highlight what genes they think we should be looking at or what might be interesting uh the USA um has a website where they report they keep up to date with all the findings, but that's based on publications. What they don't have, to the best of my knowledge, is a database of individuals or, or genetic data that is shared. Um, Japan works slightly differently as well. I mean, really what we want to do is, is, is be the exemplar of how to work in this domain uh, within our UK consortium by truly sharing data. Uh, that may not be possible worldwide, but I think the European Consortium gives an excellent example. And like I said, we've already brought in North America for a, into that grouping. Um, and we meet regularly um, at least once a year, the whole group get together. And this is scientists, clinicians, um, students, postdocs coming together to share what they think they found or what they new discoveries. Um, and then we can look in at our UK patient data and see if we find the same things. I should point out that actually 
it's not the same worldwide. I mean, there are there are certain variants that exist in certain populations um, that that are specific to that population, and, and in many cases we know why, and in some cases we don't. And a classic example is uh, a common variant in Rhodopsin, which is the P23H. That is is extremely prevalent in in the US, um, and I think we have one family in the UK with that change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very important that we work on UK changes <laughs> as well, because we don't want to miss out on any potential clinical trials or any treatments that are coming through. So, so um, yes, we need to share data. We do it as much as possible. Um, and there's lots and lots of exciting, I think, you know, as Georgina mentioned, lots of the therapies that we're developing are gene or variant specific. Um, so we do need to know that in our own population so that we can develop things like, and I'm very excited that you've got pharmaceutical companies here today because antisense oligonucleotides, I'm sure ProQR will talk about that, um, are, are very exciting to us and we've used those as preclinical examples in our retinal organoids. But again, we want to concentrate on those variants we find in our UK population so that we can benefit from any therapies that are coming through. Thank you. So we've just got a few minutes left. So um, I think this is, a, especially in the times we're living in, a very relevant question. Um, Alison, and I suspect Georgina and Kate and Denise will have uh, maybe a comment. Do you use saliva swabs for genetic testing as an alternative to blood? And if so, could this be organised by post to encourage people to get tested? So the answer is yes. I, I, I guess it's slightly different from a diagnostic perspective to a research perspective. Georgina? Um, yes, yeah, so I, right now our lab isn't accepting saliva samples because of the pandemic. We can have um, buckle swabs, which are um, uh, scrapes inside the mouth, but we can't um, have saliva samples. I guess these things will will be reviewed as the, as the pandemic um, changes. We, we definitely get best results in a diagnostic lab from a blood sample. Um, we, we definitely can get better DNA yield. And of course, if uh, um, you know, our aim with genetic testing is if we do a panel, but we don't find a gene change in that panel, there may be other tests we want to offer. And if we haven't got enough DNA, we'll have to go back and get, get more samples. So we do very much um, prefer a, a blood sample in a diagnostic lab and there are phlebotomy clinics. I know in the northwest most of our hospitals are offering phlebotomy so that we are sending out tubes and people can pop into their local hospital and get a blood sample to us. So I think we are, despite the pandemic, fairly successfully getting blood samples. I know not everyone likes to give a blood sample but um, that's what that gives us the best, best chance of getting the result. Thank you. So we literally have 90 seconds left. So just a very quick question for Kate. We've had quite a lot of questions about the promotion of research opportunities. Could you just give us a very quick overview of some of the research opportunities that could be available once you've had um, a generic, a genetic, sorry, test? In 90 seconds, very quickly. Um, so there's all sorts of things. Alison um, has touched on the importance of uh, collaboration and, and getting numbers of, of samples and data. So there are a couple of um, repositories, if you like, of data that you can get involved with. Um, there's uh, something called My Retina Tracker, which is a US-based uh, database that you can put your information into that's accessed by researchers. Uh, and also a new UK-based uh, initiative called My Eyesight, which is actually a web-based application that you can uh, use yourself to uh, store your own medical data and share that as you wish with clinicians, but also with the research community. And obviously, the more information that's in these repositories, of data, the, the more value that, that researchers can get out of them. Um, there's also uh, obviously potentially down the line clinical trials or other gene specific research that you can take part in uh, in mm. studies. Um, and industry, who we're going to hear from later, also often quite interested to speak to people with specific genetic faults because that matches a treatment that's being developed. Equally, um, there may be opportunities if you have a genetic test and you don't get a result. People like Alison probably very much value your your uh, your genome, your genetic uh, data, so that they can start looking for where that genetic fault is. So 
uh, there's all sorts of opportunities out there and um, we can help you at Retina UK link into some of those um, via our research participation panel, which is uh, information on our website. I hope that I'm in time. Wow, that was an incredible amount of information in a very short period of time. So um, well done, Kate. So unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, and um, back to you, Don. So thank you very much, all of you. You're absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Well, just to say very well done to the panel, an absolutely super discussion. I'm sure there are lots of questions still outstanding. And um, as Tina said, we'll be picking those up and uh, responding as far as we are able. Now it, we're going to have a short break. The great merit about, um, in fact, the only merit perhaps about doing this online is that you don't have to queue for the loo. So good luck. Be back by 12.10 at the latest, please. 12.10 when we will start the next session. Thanks very much indeed.